Hey, good morning, church. We want to invite you to stand with us.
praise aloud and sing his praise aloud. Oh, awake my soul and sing, we'll sing his praise aloud. Sing his praise aloud. When I was lost in the presence was where I found home. You were there and you're here right now. Yes, he is. In every high and every low, you never left me without hope. You were good and you're good right now.
trust your faithfulness, Lord. I've seen you breathe life within, so I'll pour out my praise again. You're worthy, God, you're worthy of all the things. Your promises never fail, they won't. I've got stories I live to tell, so I'll pour out my praise again. You're worthy, God, you're worthy of all of
and he has good plans for both you and me. Man, it is an honor worshiping with you all this morning. You guys brought the spirit in. Let's hear it. Come on. Hey, if you would, take a second, say hi to someone around you, and you can have a seat. Well, good morning, Union Chapel. It is an honor to be with you this morning. Uh, If we have not met yet, my name is Austin Craig, and I am the new 180 pastor here. And thank you. Thank you for the warm welcome. I'm excited to be here and to work with our middle and high school students here at Union Chapel and figure out how we can reach more students here in Delaware County. So I'm excited to be here, and I thank you for having me. Uh, Maybe you're joining us in the room or online this morning. If you would, go ahead and take a moment to check in. The best way to do that is using the Church Center app. If you don't have it, you can download the app on the App Store or the Google Play Store and just search Union Chapel Ministries and that'll connect you to us. You can check in, you can find sermon notes, um, see calendar events for upcoming things we have going on here at Union Chapel. And it's also a great way to give, uh, to partner alongside us and support all the things we do here at Union Chapel and all the things we're gonna do at Union Chapel. So we thank you for partnering with us. Speaking of events, starting March 4th, it's a Monday night, we're going to start a 22-week course called Pain to Purpose. And for that course, we are going to be diving into the emotions and the hurt that surrounds some of the pain in our life. And we're going to be diving into how we can better process that and better use that in our day-to-day. And I I brought the workbook up. The workbook's 20 bucks, so uh, $20 investment and you'll get something great. But on the back of the workbook, it says, 1 Peter 5, verse 10, and after you have suffered a little while, the God of grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. And when I think about the pain in my life in that verse, it's just very comforting. So I encourage you to join us. We think it's gonna be very meaningful. Uh, We hope to see you there March 4th, Monday night, It'll go on for 12 weeks. We can't wait. If you want to sign up, you can sign up on the app or at the Welcome Center. Heads up for all you mothers and sons in the room. I am not a mother, but I am a son. So this applies to me. We have the Mother-Son Brunch uh, kicking off on March 9th from 1030 to noon. It's going to be a morning with good food, games, laughter, um, just some time that you can spend with your mom or your son create good memories because we know that relationship is important. So we hope you will join us. Uh, It's $15 a family. You can also sign up uh, online or on the Union Chapel app. And we look forward to seeing you there. I'll be there so we can, I don't know about you guys. I trash talk my mom when we play games together. So it might get a little heated, but forgive me. (laughs) Hey, we are excited to finish up our series called Life Without Lack. Pastor Christopher is gonna wrap us up today and it's gonna be great. And we're excited for what he has to bring. And we will be kicking off next week a new sermon series called The End. And Pastor Greg will be talking about end times, biblical prophecy and what that looks like, because we know that can be a confusing and challenging topic. So we're gonna dive in it together. We're gonna learn how to best be prepared. This this sermon series isn't to elicit fear, but how do we best prepare for what the end times look like? So we're looking forward to that and we hope you will join us, bring a friend, It's gonna be great. Well, if you would bow your heads with me, I'll pray and we'll kick us off. Jesus, we love you so much. Lord, and we are excited to worship you this morning. And God, we pray that you be with our friends, both in the room and online. Whatever they're going through, whatever season of life they're in, Lord, We just pray your love, your peace, and your presence into their life. Comfort them, Lord. We love you so much. In Jesus' holy name we pray, amen. All right, if you would, check out the screen.
morning, Union Chapel. Thanks for being here this morning, and I trust that you're doing well. Just awesome to be able to worship with you. My name is Christopher Glotzbeck. I have the privilege of serving here on staff alongside just so many great and wonderful staff members here, and, and we just love being able to serve you guys. And thanks to all of you who are tuning in online. We are finishing up our four-week series on life without lack, and I just hope and pray that it has been meaningful and transformative for you. But before we get too much further into the message, I want you to take a moment and I want you to look around, all right? I want you to look around, and we are running into a really great problem. This is the only service that I'm going to be communicating this to, uh, but I want to give you a challenge, and I want to cast a vision that if you call Union Chapel your home church, if this is where you've been coming for a while and, and you're putting roots in, I would encourage you to give up for Lent, okay? So maybe you haven't done anything for Lent yet. This is an opportunity for you to give something up for Lent just until after Easter. If you could consider, and I would just challenge you to give up your seat. Maybe you've come with a group of people. Get the whole group to try out one of our other services at 8.30 or 11.30 just until after Easter. And the reason that we're doing that is that all of our data, all of our study that we've done is new families who were just always reaching and trying to figure out how to get them plugged into our church, they almost always are going to check out this service. And so what you're doing by giving an opportunity of your seat away is for them to experience what Union Chapel would be like uh, just at a better capacity. I, I just saw some people who were for the first time and they're in our like emergency seating back in the back when we've filled up and we've reached capacity and they're sitting back there. And so I'm sorry that you're doing that. And it's because we haven't cast vision for that. And so I'm just doing that in preparation for Easter. And then after Easter, you can come back to the service and we'd love to have you. But just until then, I wanna encourage you to do that. And just note that the 1130 service is the only service with childcare and children's programming up until the fifth grade. And so we hope that you take advantage of that. But again, that's why we're doing it because we just wanna make room for what God is doing here in this space, and I trust that you're able to do that. We're all adults, all Christian here. Um, Pastor Greg, when we were talking about this, he had people sign covenants to do that, but I'm just gonna believe the best about you guys, and I won't have, but maybe, maybe next week when he's back, you might be having to write down a covenant or something like that. But that's just all in good fun, but I encourage you to do that for real. Well, hey, we every week have been standing, and I want to encourage you to do that as you are able. Please stand. And we've been reciting the 23rd Psalm together. And my encouragement, honestly, throughout this whole month as we've been going through this series is to wake up every morning and just to pray this over your life, over your family, or whomever comes to your mind. Just pray over this psalm. But we recite this together, and we'll start in verse 1. And the words will be behind me on the screen as well. Starting in verse 1, it says, The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Thank you. You may be seated. I've been following the Lord for about 25 years, and from a very young age, I understood that Jesus was the Lord of my life. I trusted him. I prayed when I needed something. I, I would follow whatever he would communicate with me, and I would, I would try to live the best life that I could. And about 10 years ago, after following the Lord for 15 years, something in my walk changed. And it, it was when I was over in Africa, a lot of my life and a lot of things in my life were just falling to the wayside and I was running. And as a young man, I thought the best thing that I could do was run away from all of my problems. So I moved to West Africa. And while I was there, I, I was staying with my aunt and uncle who were full-time missionaries in Ghana. And they help with children's programming and orphanages and they help train and develop pastors there in Ghana. And while I was there, I didn't know this when I signed up. I signed up joyfully. I was really excited to just get away from some of my troubles and the issues that were going on inside of me to just start afresh. 
And so when I moved over there, I didn't know that this was going to happen, and I'm trying to be politically correct about this, but my aunt and uncle are advanced in years, and they're a little older. They've been over there since early 2000s, and they went to bed every night at like 7.30, 8 o'clock. And I did not know that as a young man, and I was going over there by myself. I thought that we were going to be, you know, hanging out, playing Scrabble together late at night, and I was not prepared for going to bed that early. And every night when they would go, well, gosh, it's time for bed, and I'm like, Oh my gosh. And so I would go down to the end of the compound and I had a, my own little space, a room and a bathroom back at the edge of the compound. And so I would go there by myself. And I had an iPod touch. I don't know if you guys ever remember those, but I had like 125 songs and five movies. And every night I was like, okay, this is great. You know, I, I know I'm extroverted. I, I love talking to people, but you know, I just need my space and I'm trying to work through some things. But let me tell you that there's only so many times that you can watch Hot Rod before it gets a little bland. And I found myself after about two weeks uh, just finding out that this wasn't gonna cut it. I needed more. And I was over in Africa, so I couldn't just bring a ton of books. I, I enjoy to read. And so I decided to pick up my Bible and begin to read. And of course, I had been following the Lord for about 15 years up until this point, And I knew God. I loved Jesus. And, and I felt like he was calling me into vocational ministry, whatever that looked like. But I, I didn't something changed when I began to do this because it really was birthed out of a necessity that I needed a friend. And the Lord, 10 years ago, went from being this shepherd, this leader, this person, that, this deity that I called out to, that I relied on for strength and encouragement and, and, and understanding of where to go. He went from this deity to this friend. The Lord became extra personal to me that I began to uh, commune with the Lord. I began to listen and understand his voice. And, and I think that something similar has happened here as we find ourselves at the end of the 23rd Psalm, that David starts the, the 23rd Psalm, and Pastor Glenn set this up well, that he was running. He was running for his life, and he was on the move, and he didn't know what was gonna happen, literally just trying to get to safety, and he communicates something very powerful. The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. But then we get to verses five and six, just the end of the psalm, and he says, the Lord prepares a table before me. And, and I don't know about you, but I don't prepare a table for anyone that isn't my friend. I'm not inviting them into my home if I don't have relationship with them, if I don't understand who they are and what they're doing. And, and there's some intimacy that happens around fellowship at the table. And so I want to walk us through what it looks like to befriend God, to make this shift, to also have the Lord as our shepherd, but to understand that the Lord is wanting to do something even more intentional in your life. He's wanting to become your friend. And the first thing that I have for us this morning is that God isn't going to eliminate the lack. There's always going to be lack in sight. I was preparing for this message a few weeks ago, and it was dark outside, and I had just gotten home from work. I had a meeting that ran a little late, and I was just spending some time in prayer because it was just a really difficult and hard meeting, and, and there were a lot of things that were going on, and I come home, and I was just praying. And I, I have this psalm in my mind constantly. I'm just meditating on it throughout the day, and I just felt the Lord say to me, Christopher, why would you settle for anything less than the table that I have prepared for you? The table that I am, am, am making for you, for you to sit down and find rest and comfort at. And then I was literally, I went over to write it down in my journal so that I could meditate on it and think about it. And on my way to get my journal, I heard my wife scream. And my wife is very stoic. She doesn't scream very often. There isn't a lot of uh, emotion elicited from her. And so I knew something was wrong. And so I ran over to my wife. I said, is everything okay? She said, there are two people at our front door. And maybe we should be more invitational as followers of Jesus and have our porch light on, but we're, we're human. We forgot, okay? And we don't typically turn our porch light on, but our porch light was off. And I looked through the, the window, and there are two men standing at our door. And I'm like, what in the world? So I open up the door and, they're, and I turn on the porch light and they're dressed to the nines, have a bow tie on and a really nice shirt. And I said, can I help you? 
And they said, yeah, of course. We were just wondering if you had a few moments to speak about our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And these Mormon missionaries have now found their way to my front door. And to be honest with you, I wish I could. I'm not there yet, but I just couldn't help myself. And so I had to have a conversation with them. And this conversation turns into a 45-minute conversation. And then I look at my watch and I realized what time it was. And I was like, goodness, I, I, have, to, I have to go back inside. I'm sorry. And, and so they left and I walk inside. And then I get a text message from somebody here at work. And they had a question about something. So I'm responding to the question. And then my wife yells out from the bedroom, hey, can you let the dogs out? And so I'm letting the dogs out. And I'm giving them water before we go to bed. And then I lay down and I go to bed. And then I wake up the next morning, like I have been for this month, and I'm reciting the 23rd Psalm, the Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. And I just begin to pray over that, what it would look like for me to fully understand that, or for the people around me to understand, or the people here at church to understand, or on our staff team. And I begin to pray about that, and then I get to the part where it says, you prepare a table before my enemies, in the presence of my enemies, you prepare a table for me. And then it dawned on me, that I had that question that I never was able to write down because of the distractions that were happening and, and seemingly nothing was bad. Like there was nothing sinful in having this conversation with these Mormon missionaries of getting water to my dogs, serving my wife, all these things. It wasn't anything bad, but it was distracting. And this is exactly what we need to understand, that the lacks, the things that are all around us, our enemies, they're always going to be in sight. As we sit down at this table, this feast that the Lord has provided for us, there's always going to be opportunity. And again, this is a secret to the 23rd Psalm, that you, not anyone else, but you get to decide, who are you going to fix your eyes on? Who are you going to draw from? Are you going to be distracted by the enemies? It's interesting that David says, hey, the presence of my enemies are around, but my table is prepared for me. In the presence of all of them, that doubt and worry, you might be having doubt and worry in your life and you just keep praying. God, I don't want to have any doubt. God, I don't want to have any more insecurity. God, I don't want to struggle with this thing. And God is saying, I, I might not ever eliminate that. The Apostle Paul writes about this, that he, he asked the Lord three times to remove this thorn from his flesh. And the Apostle Paul just simply says, my grace is sufficient for you. For when you are weak, you are strong. Because when we get down to the bottom, we cannot help ourselves but to call out to God. And as I was worshiping, our, our production team and I were talking about what should we put on this table and I wanted so many things on this table. I wanted like the spread. I wanted, I, I thought it'd be so funny if I was just up here eating a steak in front of everybody. <laughs> and they're like, we should just be more simplistic. Like you can't go that over the top and let's just put some, let's just put some juice and some bread to symbolize the Eucharist communion, what we participate in. And, and over during the 830 service during worship, I looked over at the table and I thought, isn't that enough? Isn't the body and blood of Christ enough? Isn't that everything that we need? And it was such a, a good, good reminder. But this idea that lack will always be in sight, that we're always going to have these enemies. And, and when you think about enemies, I don't want you to think about them as like the person in first grade that pushed you down at recess and you're like, I, I will hate you forever. Like not that enemy, but the enemy is, is the, the thing or the purpose uh, in your life that you feel like is just bringing you away from God, like the doubt or the insecurity or the addiction that you're struggling with or, or the relational tension that you have in your family or in your marriage. Those are the things that I'm talking about, that when David writes, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies, I think that he's talking about the situations in our life, the sickness that you've prayed for so many times that just keep flaring back up. Or the child who isn't walking faithfully with Jesus right now, that you raised them the right way. And you're questioning, like, God, like, I brought them to church. I brought them to family first every Wednesday. And now, look at them over there. They get to sit with their family. And I know for a fact that they didn't bring them to the youth programming. What did I do wrong and what did they do right? What did I do to deserve what I got? And Jesus is just saying, fix your eyes on me. The lack will always be there. It will always be in sight. But you get to decide what you're going to look at. They will always be in reach, just for far enough out just to grab a hold of them and take them if we want them. And Jesus and his kindness and his goodness allow us to do that. Allow us to rely at times on our own strength. 
And will you choose Jesus? Will you choose to fix your eyes on him? The second thing that I have for us this morning is that he gives us his spirit to be our God. We can't do this alone. We can't choose Jesus all by ourselves. I've tried it. We need help because there's so many things that can distract us. And in Psalm 23, verse 5, he says this, that you anoint our head with oil. Our cup overflows. And David would have understood in his time and age that this oil was symbolic of just a rejuvenation, a refreshing. Pastor Glenn talked about this a few weeks ago, that when they would anoint someone's head with oil, they were saying, hey, listen, you don't have to be in this pit anymore. You can rise up above it. You can get up. You can be refreshed. And then he goes on to say, you make my cup overflow. And I love the symbolism here. In John 16, verse 7, Jesus is teaching his disciples. And and he says, you know, listen, very truly I tell you, it is better if I go. He's talking to his disciples, his followers, the people who have been walking with him for a few years. And and I just imagine them looking at one another and saying, wait a minute. How, How could it be any better than this? You're our teacher. You're our rabbi. You're our professor. You're the Lord and Savior of the world, how could it get any better than being with you in your presence? And I just imagine Jesus smiling back at his disciples, and and he's about to do something that they don't even have comprehension of. He's about to do a new thing, a beautiful thing. And he's saying, unless I go, the advocate will never come to you. The advocate is is this word translated as helper, this paraclete, this this. Spirit and this presence of God that is able to sustain us and help us get through. And what Jesus is saying is, hey, listen, if I go, if I go away, I will send the helper back to you. And all of us, when we make a decision to follow Jesus, are given the presence of God in the form of his spirit. And we're just a vessel, an empty vessel. And what the Lord is wanting to do, and Pastor Greg talks about this often, is what would it look like for us just to be empty vessels, for the Lord to fill up? And maybe this is a bad analogy, but as I've been thinking about this, I, I imagine myself at the Thanksgiving dinner table, and my uncle, who who's really thinks that he's funny, probably a lot like me, but he really isn't that funny, he'll do this thing when I was growing up where I would say, hey, Mike, could you give me some water? And he'd be like, absolutely, tell me when. And he would begin to fill up my water with, you know, the, my glass with water. And then I would say, okay, Mike, that's good. I'm good. He, and he would keep going. And it would get up and then it would begin to overflow. And I'm like, hey, stop. What are you doing? He's like, you didn't say when. And I'm like, oh, oh, come on, come on. And, and maybe that's a bad analogy, but that is exactly what the Lord is doing in our life. He's saying, hey, listen, if you just bring me the vessel, if you just bring me yourself and say, hey, listen, I'm whatever you want. I'm I'm yours. Whatever you need, I'm yours. And he's just going to keep filling it up. The apostle Paul puts it this way, that we are the aroma of Christ. Jesus says it this way, that we are a city on a hill. When David says that my cup overflows, it's a distraction. Could you imagine if I was just walking on stage and there was just water pouring over the glass? Just everywhere I go, it was just spilling everywhere. You'd be like, that's weird. There's something different. There's something strange going on up there. Why is that happening? And the exact same thing is happening when we follow Jesus. We cannot help but be seen. People are going to begin to look at you. The Apostle Paul goes as far as to say, you'll smell different. You are the aroma of Christ. Jesus says that you are a city on a hill. They would have understood this, that they would be walking for miles, and they're just looking for their next place. And then all of a sudden, they see this light lit up sky. That's where we go. And that is what Jesus is saying about us. When we become Christians and followers of Jesus, when God anoints our head with oil, when he gives us his spirit and his presence, you cannot be helped but to be seen. That God is doing something in your life and through your life, and you get to decide if you're gonna be a conduit of his love and affection to the world around you. He is giving us his spirit to be our guide. I love that about him. In Psalm 34, verse five, it says this. We talked about this at the benediction last week. It simply says that those who look to the Lord are radiant. Their faces will never be covered in shame. 
This idea that when we begin to spend time with the Lord, our whole body, our whole mind is transformed to look more like Jesus. I can tell you that there are so many times in my life that people come up to me and they ask me, there's something different about you. I was at a coffee shop with one of our 180 volunteers and spending time with him and somebody just came up to me during our coffee time. I was just meeting with him and we were just connecting and he came up to me and he said, are you Christopher Glansback? I'm like, oh no. You know, like I might owe this guy money or something. What's going on? I'm checking my wallet to make sure I have it on me. And I said, yes, sir. And he said, are you the senior pastor of Union Chapel? And I could confidently say, no, sir. You know, I'm not, I'm not that. That's Reverend Greg Paris. You can reach him at Paris at unionchapel.com. Uh, and, he, and he cut to the chase. He said, well, are you gonna become the senior pastor? I said, well, you know, God willing, I, I, you know, I'm praying for that and that's been announced, but uh, yes, sir. And he said, I don't go to Union Chapel, but Union Chapel has changed my life. And he began to tell me the story and I'm sure that I'll share this story later, but uh, just the, the, the impact that this place has had because the spirit has been poured out on this place, that we have become this empty vessel. And so I know that a lot of people in this room, they're like, yeah, I've got it. I understand what's happening. I understand, I've experienced it, I've witnessed it. I understand how to follow Jesus. But I just want you to know that people see a difference in you, that when you follow Jesus, they can understand that there's something different about the way that you walk and the way that you raise your children and the way that you talk and the way that you interact with other people, the way that you communicate with people who are grieving, who are at loss. There's something different about that. And then my third and final point is this, that the kingdom of God starts right now. And so many times in the church, we ask this question, pastors are notorious for asking this question, what, what would happen if you were to die today? If you were driving home and you died on your way home? Well, I think a better question to ask from the pulpit is what would happen if you didn't die today? What would happen in your life if you drove home and you made it home and you still have that tension and relationship with your mother-in-law or your sister-in-law or your coworker or the things that you, your boss has been talking to you about? And you're like, why do I just keep getting overlooked for this promotion at work? Or again, what's going on with my kids? I'm, I'm thinking I'm raising them the right way, but nothing seems to make sense. And I, I love this idea that, that the psalmist, that David writes this in Psalm 23, 6, surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. That we can't help <laughs> but for the Lord to follow us with his love and his goodness, his mercy, his affection for us, and that we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. It starts now, it starts right now, that we have access to the kingdom of God, that what God is doing can begin here, right now, that he is wanting to transform you in a way that you never thought possible. Uh, Thursday morning, I was just rehearsing and thinking about my message, and I didn't really know how I was going to end it. And the Lord, about 10 years ago, when I was in that room in Africa, he challenged me. And, and again, I don't know if this is the Lord. This is, I'm not telling you this is not like a prescription on how to get by and how to engage with the Lord. This is just what has been helpful for me in my life. And I felt like the Lord wanted me to share it with you. But I've really gotten to a point where I used to ask the Lord for a lot. I, almost every time that I would do something, I would be seeking the Lord for just so much guidance and counsel and just trying to get understanding. And I've really stopped asking the Lord for things. Of course, I still ask the Lord for things at times, for healing, for provision, for him to show up in ways that I don't understand. But I felt like when I was in that room in Africa, the Lord challenged me and said, Christopher, when you ask me things, I'm happy to do them but really you're, sh- you're, you're just selling yourself short because I wanna do something much bigger and better than you could ever think, dream, or imagine in your life. And so what if, instead of sitting down and, and opening up your journal and writing down all these prayer requests, you just sat down and listened to me? You just began to worship me. You just began to become more mindful of me because what happened in that room is that the Lord went from this shepherd, this guide, and he still is in my life, don't get me wrong, I still pray and I still engage with the Lord, but not as much as I used to. And he has become a friend that I listen to, 
that I understand his voice. We talked about this week one in John 10, that the sheep know the shepherd's voice. And so Thursday morning, I'm sitting there, I went to the gym that morning and I got back, I took a shower and I was getting dressed and I just felt the Lord. I was just being mindful of God. I was just in this moment where I was just, I was just thinking about God. I, was, I didn't have an agenda. I didn't come up with anything, but I just felt like the Lord. And I'm not communicating this like it happens every day of my life, but in this moment, in this particular moment, I felt the Lord say, Christopher, I am here. Get in a posture to receive from me. And again, I didn't really know what that meant. And, and so I, got, I could not help myself. I got down on the floor and I laid face flat on the ground. And as I was down on the ground, I just felt like the Lord just reveal things to me and share things to me and, and tell me how and which I need to live my life better, to love people more holistically and understand and get to know their story and ask more questions and not talk as much. And I just sat down on the, on, I was just laying face down on the floor, just receiving from the Lord. And then he invited me to share this story. He brought this story to my mind that I wanted to share with you. And again, it might not be helpful for you. In fact, for some of you in this room, you're like, dude, this is weird. I don't know what's going on, but I'm just going to share what I feel like the Lord has asked me to share. When my wife and I were going through premarital counseling, the pastor who was going to marry us had us walk through this process. And we were at the time of our premarital counseling to talk about bedtime routines. One thing that you need to know about me is that before I came here to Union Chapel, I was in pastoral ministry and, and campus ministry over at Ball State University. And so I would stay up really late connecting with students. I was at the rec center hanging out with them. And when I got married, and then I didn't know that when I was in Africa, it would prepare me so much for marriage, but I know that it might've been offensive that I said that, these, that my aunt and uncle were advanced in age. My wife wants to go to bed at like 8.30, 9 o'clock every night. So the Lord knew he was preparing me in my heart. So we were talking about these bedtime routines and, and my wife is like, well, I go to bed at nine o'clock. You know, I wanna get up early and go to the gym at five in the morning, it comes quick. And so we're going to bed at, at nine o'clock. And I was like, shoot, you know, like, <laughs> It stinks. I'm used to going to bed at like 12.30, 1 o'clock, hanging out with college students. And the other thing that you need to know about me, and again, you might be praying over the 23rd Psalm. We still have a week of it left. And, and you might be praying for me as your enemy once you find out what teams I root for. But I'm a West Coast guy. And so I love the San Francisco Giants and baseball. I love the 49ers and football. They broke my heart a couple weeks ago. Uh, I thought that the Lord would hear my prayer. You know, it, just, it was hard. It was hard for me. Made it all the way there and just fell short. And I love the Lakers probably more than any other team. I love the Los Angeles Lakers. Kobe Bryant and I shared a birthday. And so I just, I loved watching Kobe Bryant growing up. And so the thing that you need to know about these West Coast teams is the games are on late at night. And so I'm thinking through my mind, I'm like, oh no. You know, like we're going to bed before these games even air. You know, like 90 minutes before they go up on television. And so I'm, I'm working out and I'm like, okay, babe, you know, like marriage is all about compromise. And so what if, you know, I fall asleep with the TV every night, seven days a week. What if three days a week we fall asleep with the TV, you get four days, you know, like we're compromising. And she's like, great idea. You know, we're like engaged, we're, we love each other a ton and we're in front of this pastor. And so we shake on it, you know, I'm like, we both win. Since we've been married, we've fallen asleep with the TV zero times. We have never fallen asleep with the TV on. It, uh, I do it. It's a joy, the joy, joy to be able to do it. And, uh, but anyway, so I get married, and I don't really ever get to watch the Lakers play anymore. And so I wake up every morning. This is no exaggeration. I wake up every morning, the, night, the, the morning after they played, and I, I love watching the highlights. And another thing that you need to know about me, I'm gonna take it a step further and people might get uncomfortable, is I'm actually a really big Kentucky basketball fan. I love the Kentucky Wildcats. I know, I know it's so terrible. But one thing that you need to know is Anthony Davis, who won a national championship, beat IU in the Sweet 16, okay? I know, I know, I know, I know. Uh, but anyway, he plays for the Lakers. And so it's like this beautiful marriage of my favorite professional team and my favorite college team coming together. And so I love watching and Anthony Davis play. And so I would wake up every morning and I would love watching the NBA like highlights of Anthony Davis just dominating. And, and then one morning, getting yeah, getting injured. Yeah, he does get injured a lot, Larry, you're right. But, um, but anyway, I was, I was at a coffee shop and I was meeting with this student for discipleship. And he was like, so what did you do this morning? 
And the first thing that I told him, I said, well, you know, every morning it starts out the same. I wake up and I spend time watching the Laker highlights. And he looked at me like he was disgusted. And it wasn't like a disgust that I was cheering for the wrong team. It was like a, a different type of disgust. So I looked at him and I said, what's going on? He was like, aren't you a pastor? <laughs> and then I became defensive. I was like, what, you what are you talking about? You know, I'm getting like a little mad. And he said, well, aren't you a pastor? Like, aren't you supposed to like wake up and like spend time in the word? And I was like, I mean, it's not like I don't spend time with the, the Lord. It's just that isn't the first thing that I do in the morning. He was like, man, I don't know about that, you know? And so like, we're wrestling with this and I'm mad. Like I kind of got defensive a little bit. And so I went home and I, and I began to spend time with the Lord about that. And uh, this is where it might get weird for some of you, but I just want to encourage you just to embrace it to find yourself doing this just for a couple weeks to see if it works out for you. But this is what happened for me. So I, I went home and I began to wrestle with the Lord about this and I was like, I just love watching the Lakers. And I felt like the Lord was asking me to invite him into watching the highlights together. And I know it sounds weird, right? But hear me out, listen to what happened in my life. So the next time that the Lakers played, the night before I woke up next morning early, and I got out my phone and I said, all right, let's watch this together. And so we began to watch the highlights and I was like, God, did you see that D'Angelo Russell like lobbed Anthony Davis? He rose up above the rim and he threw it down. And I be, just became more mindful of God in my everyday life. The things that I was already doing, I invited the Lord into to have communion with him. And you know what's interesting? And I never thought that this would happen, but after a year of waking up, and watching highlights with the Lord, I just heard the Lord, just a gentle nudge. It was just a nugget. It was just an invitation. It was an opportunity. And I felt like the Lord would say this, hey, Christopher, you know the thing that's actually giving you joy? The thing that you're actually looking forward to in the morning isn't the highlights. It's spending time with me. And so I began, little by little, of just three minutes, I would spend some time being mindful of God. And then we would watch the Laker highlights together. And then three minutes turned into five minutes. It turned into 20 minutes. And then it, it began to build on it. And then the other day, that Thursday morning, I thought that the Lakers had played Wednesday night. They just came back from the All-Star break. And I didn't even notice. I, I was like, they played last night. And I am now on the floor, prostrate before the Lord, just receiving from him. And it wasn't until the afternoon I was, I was telling a friend about this encounter that I had with the Lord and, and I just couldn't help myself. I was just overwhelmed by the presence of God. Every time that I spoke about it, I was just weeping about how good God has been. And then I was like, the Lakers played last night. And I looked it up and they didn't even play the night before. I like my calendar now has gotten all messed up because I am just pursuing Jesus. And I'm not saying that watching basketball and doing all those things, gosh, I still love watching the Lakers play. I still do. But man, I've become more mindful of inviting the Lord into it. And in his book, Life Without Lack, Dallas Willard talks about this, that we invite the Lord into these normal everyday opportunities. Remember when we were talking about week one, having Jesus in the front seat of our car, we're just inviting the Lord into opportunities to commune with us. And I love what Dallas says in, in his book, Life Without Lack, he says, this isn't more work. This isn't taxing. This isn't difficult to do. Like, it shouldn't be burdensome. You're like, well, I guess I have to watch the Laker highlights with the Lord this morning. No, 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 it isn't like that. It's an opportunity. He says it isn't more work, it's more joy. And it brings joy into our life, into our situation. And it's something that happens that's just so beautiful. And you'll find yourself doing things that you never thought were possible. You begin to talk to people I found myself, you know, I went to school, I double majored in journalism and telecommunications, and in college, all they told us was to defend truth. Like, that's all you have to do. I found myself, I was talking with a friend the other day, and the things that he was saying were just wrong. Like, I was like, I can, like, quickly get on Google and show you the statistics. You are wrong. And that's what I felt in my spirit, to just tell him that he was wrong. And then right before I was about to pull out my, you know, Dr. Google and show him all the things in which he were wrong, and I felt the Lord stop me and said, just let him speak. You don't have to defend this. It's no big deal. It's water under the bridge. Just let it go. And I was like, what? That doesn't. And so you'll find yourself doing things that don't even make any sense. And maybe in a few months, it'll click with you. Like, I understand that 
I'm speaking right now and, and maybe 15% of people are gonna do the things that I ask them to do or en encourage them to do. But then one day you're gonna wake up and you're like, maybe I should try this because the way that I'm doing life isn't working. And so maybe you'll forget what I'm talking about. And so if that happens to you, I just want you to remember this section of scripture because this is what life can look like in the kingdom of God. Because life in the kingdom starts right now. You have access to be able to start participating in what heaven will be like, the new heaven and the new earth right now, here in Muncie, Indiana. You can begin to experience a new type of reality, a new way of living, a new way of walking, a new way of talking. It can all be transformed. And this is what it looks like. The Apostle Paul writes about this in Romans chapter 12, verses 9 through 21. I'm just going to read it, and this is how we're going to end. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil, cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor, serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Doesn't it sound backward, countercultural? The disciples who were following Jesus didn't even fully understand this. When Jesus was being betrayed, Peter got out his knife and cut off a man's ear to protect Jesus. And Jesus was like, what are you doing? Peter says, I'm protecting you. Like, they're trying to arrest you. We're fighting back. And Jesus said, no. <laughs> no, we're not. He reaches out and heals the man's hand. He's teaching us a new way to live a new way to posture ourselves that is so countercultural that it doesn't even make sense. Like I have a hard time saying like, do what this is saying because it's so anti what we've been taught and the way in which we want to live our life, it's anti to the flesh. Bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice, mourn with those who mourn, live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but willing to associate with low positions. Do not become conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy, and we just talked about our enemies, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not, over, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And this is a new way of living. That when we find ourselves seated at the table that he has prepared for us, and we are so distracted and we can catch the glimpses of, of, the, of the enemy, the thing that is against our good. When we find ourselves wanting to look away and Jesus is just beckoning us to fix our gaze on him, you get to decide. Not your wife, not your husband, not your kiddos, not your parents. You get to decide who you're gonna fix your eyes on. And then he gives us his spirit. Our cup overflows. He anoints our head with oil so that we can be empty vessels for him and his spirit. And then we get to experience life in the kingdom today. Right now in this next worship set, when we begin to worship, we get a glimpse of heaven. What it might look like when we enter into the throne room of God, that his presence is here, that it has been poured out on all of us, and that we get to experience what life in the kingdom is right now because his goodness and his mercy will follow us all the days of our lives and that we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And so what would change about your life if you believed that, if you held on to that truth? What would it look like this week if you became more mindful of God, that you began to invite him into the everyday, ordinary things that are happening in your life? You standing in line to get checked out at the grocery store, the Lord is with you. You're driving down the street, somebody cuts you off, and the Lord is sitting next to you. And the things that you once did where you blared on the horn, you sped up and you waved at him like, I see you, you don't do that kind of stuff anymore. And it's so little, but then all of a sudden you get to experience the peace of Christ that surpasses all understanding at a deeper level than you ever did before. Let us pray. Jesus, we love you. We're so thankful for you. 
We thank you that you give us the keys to understanding a life in the kingdom of God that starts right now here in this space. God, I pray that people would be open and receptive to receive from you. Maybe people in this room right now that don't have a relationship with you might be opened up to the opportunity. What would it look like to make the Lord my shepherd? God, I eventually want him to be my friend, but right now, what would it look like for him to be the Lord and protector of my life? Jesus, help us to get to the next step in our faith journey. Whatever that is, that's confessing our sins to you believing in who you are and what you've done for us, or it's befriending you and getting to know your voice and understanding who you are and and why you're doing the things that you're doing. I don't know where we're at, but all of us are on a faith journey, and God, I pray for the strength for us to take the next step, the next step in obedience to who you are and what you're doing. God, reveal that to us. Jesus, we love you and we praise you, and we pray all of this in your beautiful and holy and mighty name. Amen. The dead are gonna rise. The blind will see the light And all the earth will praise the Lord The young are gonna see The old are gonna dream And all the earth will praise the Lord Not by strength
together, I just thought about how lavish God is to us. That we don't, we don't think about praying, hey God, I have an empty vessel. Just, we would just ask for you to fill it up a little bit for us to be satisfied. But what the Lord does in his generosity is he just pours it out. That he just fills it up more than can even be contained in the vessel because he loves you. God isn't stingy. God wants to do so much more in your life than you can ever think or imagine. And so would you let him? Would you become, just to be in a posture to become available to what God is doing in your life and letting him do it. For you to be a conduit of his love and affection to the world around us. And so in order to do that, we need his peace and understanding and we end the same way every single week with this benediction, the blessing. And the blessing goes like this. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Would his face shine upon you so that you might be radiant and understand that an interaction with the Lord changes everything. And would he bless you as a result so that you might be able to bless other people. This blessing that we get isn't just for ourselves. It isn't so that we can just keep it and say, man, isn't it good to be blessed by the Lord? But no, our blessing, the blessing that we receive from Jesus is to go and give it, give it to other people. Our cup flows over, not so that we can go find other cups to, to get and put into our cupboard. No, it's for you to give to other people what you've received from God. And so would the Lord bless and keep you to do that? to give you the strength and endurance to participate in life in the kingdom that starts right now, here in this moment as we walk out of this building. Forevermore be at peace because Jesus loves you. Amen. Yeah. Have a great week, guys.